Okay, so um, we've got this wonderful strategy and we're now looking at uh, some of the items in um, priority number four. And uh, if I could have the next slide, please. I want to bring to your attention, if you haven't already seen this, um, this is a particularly wonderful piece of work that Rosemary Calder and um, uh, Maria Duggan undertook with, with a group of us in 2016, and I really recommend that you have a look at it because it's a, it's a really compelling reason f for why there should be investment in women's mental health. Um, I wish we could... We could um, I don't know, beat people over the head with this perhaps, but uh, it's, a, it's a really great piece of work. So this is what it looks like. Um, please get it if you haven't already had a look at it. Next slide, thanks. So mental, and this is from that particular piece of work by Maria Duggan, that mental health policy in Australia is gender blind and does not consider women's mental health across the life course. One of the great um, problems that we're coping with and not, well, we're struggling with in Victoria is that the Royal Commission into mental health has not called uh, any woman uh, or woman woman's advocacy group <laughs> or any particular related to women's mental health. There has been nothing so far. So uh, friends from uh, Women's Health Victoria uh, have formed an alliance and we, we are hoping that we can do something, but it's particularly um, awful that we've got to this point of a Royal Commission and the word women's mental health hasn't even crossed anyone's lips. Um, these are all things that you know very well, so I'm going to flip through these fairly fast, but, you know, mental ill health represents the leading cause of disability and burden for of the non-fatal illnesses for women. 43%, which is a huge percentage, have experienced mental ill health at some time. Next. And when we look at the graphical description, um, this is not a game where women want to win, but unfortunately the experiences of mental ill health are markedly increased, uh, except in the area of alcohol dependence. But in fact, this, there's some awful figures that show that in fact the, the gap is closing, but the discrepancies here are very, very high. And these are very conservative estimates. Next, thanks. And of course, as we've seen in many um, studies, the cost of this in, in women, the cost of mental ill health in women is enormous uh, with a number of different um, factors that come into it. And the two, 22 billion per year is just that which can be measured. So that's just lost productivity. We can't measure all the other things. Next, thanks. So clearly gender and mental health, is there's many different reasons to consider that um, men and women are different, have different patterns of mental ill health. There are different uh, exposures, different risk factors, different vulnerabilities, and many different theories. Next, thanks. Um, I think Jane uh, eloquently spoke about the social aspects, but I'm going to put a plug in for biology because the biology, the neurobiology area has moved fast. And unfortunately, Vikram's comments are really out of date, and I'll explain why. And we need to think in an integrated fashion. We really need to bring the biology into play with the psychosocial aspects because otherwise we're missing a really critical factor in helping us get our individual... Um, clients, patients, better. Um, and it is something that has moved considerably in the way other diseases and people experiencing other diseases have looked at it. I'm always amazed and impressed at the advances that have been made in, say, HIV AIDS. That's a great area to look at because, yes, there are social determinants and factors there, but the thing that switched from it being a fatal illness that everybody um, pretty much died from, to now living with, quite happily living with, uh, it has been, in fact, a whole explosion of social researchers working with biological diehard, you know, medical researchers working with the psychology of it all. And you do need everybody pulling together. So I think this is a, a, an artificial discrepancy, but, you know, we really need to meld it all and this is why some of the opportunities we have in this, this forum, this workshop, is really critical. Next, thanks. So I am going to focus because the biology is underdone, badly underdone, I believe, in women's mental health. And I'll try and explain how we integrate that next. So, for example, the hormones are no longer just hormones. You don't just bother with, OK, there are, there's a 4% of women who have PND, or post-perinatal depression, in 
an affluent area and there's a, a huge percentage somewhere else. Yes, that's correct because everything that happens in trauma, in, in experiencing um, deprivation, privation, get connected back into a whole system that is disrupted in terms of brain biology through the hormones, through the neurotransmitter systems and through neurocircuitry, which all interplay uh, to actually then produce difficulties and symptomatic um, uh, outcomes. Next, thanks. So, for example, in women, we do know that there is a considerable increase in depression, particularly related to reproductive events. Um, PMS, PMDD, PMDD is real. It is a premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Some women experience considerable depression cyclically. And when we look at their stories, and this is really critical that, again, we look at the stories of the individual person, she will tell us often often, often, about early life traumas. Some experience of hardship somewhere in that formative point. It's not by coincidence that the interplay between a disrupted hormonal milieu and early life trauma coexist. And so we find that a number of biological conditions are like that. Even diehard illnesses that are easy to measure, diabetes is a good example, has got a particular trigger point related to what is going on in the environs, and in this case, obesity. So this is my point. Please, in mental ill health and mental health, let's not throw the biology under the bus because we're going to lose a particularly important group of collaborators, but more importantly, the capacity to improve outcomes for very many women who suffer really suffer. And we lose too many good women um, to lots of factors. But this is an area where we should be able to help and turn it around. Depression and the oral contraceptive pill, um, postnatal and perimenopausal depressions. I'm going to go on a little bit more about some of these, but I, I really want to sp spend some time talking about this other issue that is um, a soapbox that I'm going to get on and hopefully convert people in the room to help me. Next, thanks. So PMDD, next, thank you. So again, this is a real entity and it's really distressing when I see women in my clinic who have struggled with PMDD, yes, with, the, with something going on in the early life and then further traumas, but they haven't been able to convince anyone in the medical profession to take this seriously. When she says, I can see what's going on, this goes back to Vijay's comment, just, you know, the story's there. She's got the story, she's actually made the diagnosis, but it's not heard. And that just then adds to her woes because now she's got the impression, well, not the impression, but, you know, she's told, you know, you don't know what you're talking about or that's pathetic or, or um, let's find the, the real problem here. Or worse, she gets treated with an SSRI, Prozac, etc., which has its own significant side effects and doesn't target this kind of depression. So now we've got several problems. She'll gain weight as a result of the SSRI and, yes, those medications do cause weight gain, which was not talked about. So now we have another problem. And all of this is adding up to the invalidation that this particular individual and many individuals like this feel. We did an SBS series recently um, for Viceland. And um, the worst, worst thing, if I could go to the next um, slide, is this bottom line, PMDD is a brain-related dysfunction in response to a number of other um, environmental factors, but nonetheless, it's a brain issue. Do not go to a obstetrician gynecologist and have everything ripped out. Unfortunately, we've had 22-year-olds who've had total hysterectomies and ophorectomies and, you know, the, the, the sort of assault that goes on surgically is a dreadful thing because when all is said and done... This is due to changes in brain circuitry, brain chemistry, that's not going to be fixed by having end organs uh, you know, just taken out. So this is one of the issues that we need to constantly be uh, monitoring and teaching our health practitioners about <coughs> that these are conditions that are real and they do exist and there are hormone treatments to help the women who have these particular conditions while we're also providing psychological <laughs> supports to be able to understand whether there is an abusive relationship uh, operating as well or there are other issues. 
So um, there's only one pill on the market, which is mood neutral, which is Zoli. Next one. And this is a problem with depression and the pill. There is de novo depression that is created for some women who are sensitive to the environment of the uh, pill and that, in fact, at this stage of the pill having been one of the best things that could have happened for women to be able to take charge of their reproductive functioning, we still haven't got a pill that's mood neutral. The progestogen in the pill is um, uh, very depressive for many women. And again, we haven't got the biomarkers to be able to go, you and you and you are very sensitive to progesterone and you're fine because we don't have that yet. But there are people working on that. And again, we think this is going to be a programming of what has happened early on in, in life. But nonetheless, there's big studies that show that there is a considerable de novo depression or an exacerbation of depression created by having the wrong pill. And so, again, we need to be lobbying manufacturers to actually look at this in even the testing, the, uh, the randomised controlled trials of the pill, because we don't get there uh, um, in, in many ways. Next, thanks. Now, um, I'm very briefly going to say perimenopausal depression is under-recognised and underrated. And I have no wish to make menopause into a medical condition, but next thanks, we have too many women, up to 16-fold increase in depression in the age group because of a whole shift that goes on in the gonadal hormone axis. And so again, this is the second highest completed suicide group, and that statistic is not well known. People talk about um, adolescent suicide and youth suicide, and that's dreadful. But this is another dreadful statistic that is a silent statistic. So we need to bring this up to think about what is going on in our middle-aged women who are the linchpins in society in many, many ways. Next, thanks. Um, so we've been working in this area. No, I'll just flick through, thanks. I just want to go through all these, and I'm happy for you to have these slides, um, to think about what can we do that is useful in treatment? And of course, this goes alongside a whole range of other lifestyle issues. Now, just briefly, I want to quickly talk about this condition. Next, thanks. Which is complex trauma disorder, in my view. This is the story of Emma, who was raised by her single mum. Her father <coughs> left when she was five. She was sexually abused by her mother's boyfriend between the ages of eight and 14. She told her mother, who didn't believe her, left home and was a street kid for a while. Next, thanks. So she now cuts herself and says this makes her feel alive. She couldn't complete school. She has a bad memory. She feels empty inside and she often gets enraged. Next, thanks. So the official, and she's very overweight. Next, thanks. This is the diagnosis that she receives. You'll know many women, particularly it is women, um, although there is a possibility for men to have this condition too, but many women receive this diagnosis. Next, thanks. Which is awful. If you tell somebody they have a personality disorder, you're robbing them of themselves. This is them. This is her. She is a woman of her own right who um, has coped and survived. So we're working on trying to get rid of that term and I'm facing enormous, enormous um, problems from within my own profession. So if there's any feminists in the room... Um, I would really urge you to get on board with us to help us because this is like that old argument of shell shock in our war veterans versus hysteria in females with the same, same symptom load. And this is exactly what we're seeing here. We are helped by the ICD-11 where, where there's a term now coming up called complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Complex because it happened, whatever the stress... Well, in her case, in Emma's case, we know what happened and it was a long time ago, and it wasn't just one event, it was several events. Next, thanks. So again, these symptoms are very PTSD-like, the constant anxiety, the fear, the rage, the problems in terms of self, etc., dissociation, self-harm. Next, thanks. Um, and we're fighting with people who have made their careers on, on based on, on calling this a personality disorder, and so they don't want to let that go. It's not good because the outcomes for the individuals uh, are really terrible. And this is a high percentage and growing in our society. This is not a past issue. This is becoming a worst issue because the incidences of sexual abuse on our girls is higher than you would 
think and higher than anybody ever would want. Um, so we've got this growing problem and it's an intergenerational issue as well because it manifests in terms of how this particular child is parented if her mother was invalidated and has this particular trauma. Um, and I, it is a trauma. Once we start saying the word trauma, we change the focus. We change the focus to she's not pathetic and personality disordered. She's actually courageous and survived a horrible trauma and has the capacity to then move forward. You also open the door to trauma therapies. Next, thanks. You also can look at um, trying to help with the consequences of physical health. And I know there's a session on violence and uh, body issues, and this is very key. Next, thanks. We also can think about the biology of stress and how do you actually help to turn that round to give her the tools in a biological, psychological sense to then fight her battles. Next, thanks. So again, I know I've gone through in huge speed. Next. But you know, um, we are looking at things in a different way and trying to reframe what was considered a person, what is considered a personality disorder as can we give this particular individual a medal for surviving what she survived and now look at how we can arm her to go on from here rather than condemning her to being personality disordered. So that's one of the current battles that we're considering and fighting. And I know that the, the preventative work has to be done to improve the level or to get rid of as much as we can the violence against our young because uh, it's, it's a lifelong story that is terrible. Um, so I end on a really gloomy note. Sorry, <laughs> but thank you very much for your attention. Today I am going to be talking about some big data that I've got from the Australian Longitudinal Study of Women's Health, just to give you an overview of some of the lessons we have learnt um, about women's mental health from using this data. Sorry. When we think about health, the World Organisation, um, the World Health Organisation, defines health generally as a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So I really like this definition. It acknowledges the complex nature of what drives our health, including those social determinants of health. But importantly, this definition acknowledges that mental health is an, an, an essential component of our overall health. And today I want to show you just, as I've said, some brief snapshots of what we have learned about women's health by looking at their mental health over a, a period of 20 years in our longitudinal study and also looking at the health across some generations of women. So mental health has been a, an important focus of the Australian Longitudinal Study of Women's Health. The Longitudinal Study, for those of you that don't know, have been following three cohorts of women since 1996. And they've been sent surveys around every three years to examine a range of biological, social and economic factors that are relevant to their health. In 2013, we actually recruited a new cohort of young women, and they were born in the early 90s and largely recruited through social media, and they are going to be surveyed every year online about their health. So we're lucky now that we have more than 20 years of data available for the original three cohorts of women, and this longitudinal nature of the data provides us with a unique opportunity now to look at the mental health of these women over time and across the generations. So this is just to give you a really broad overview of what we find happens with mental health across women. So what you see here are average mental health scores with higher scores indicating better mental health. And over more than a decade, the data shows that mental health generally improves with age, except you can see when women reach their 80s, where mental health appears to decline again. But of concern are the low mental health scores among the young women at around the age of 20. Yeah, next one. So young women are particularly vulnerable to poor mental health. And this figure is kind of showing that data in the previous slide in a different way. It shows the proportion of women across the cohorts who had mental health scores indicating a probable diagnosis of depression. Yeah, next one. 
And what we find is that around one in five women will have symptoms that indicate a probable diagnosis of depression. So psychological distress is a real concern for young women. And the emergence of mental health problems during late adolescence and, er and early adulthood demonstrates that this is really a critical time for support. And importantly, it shows that we need to be intervening long before these symptoms emerge to really sort of pre prevent those long-term problems from occurring. So the original young cohort of our women that I was just talking about, they're now in their 40s. And while they're still young, I'd like to think of them that way, they are now at a life stage that's typically associated with better mental health. As these women have aged over the last 20 years, we know there's been enormous social, economic and technological changes coupled with advances in medicine. But the question is, have things changed for better or for worse? What does mental health look like in new generations of young women? Is life a party for young women these days? Yeah. And to shed light on this, we have gone back. We've gone back to data from our new young cohort of women um, who were born in the, in the early 90s, who were recently recruited as part of the longitudinal study. So more than 17,000 women completed a first survey in 2013 when they were aged 18 to 23. And we've been following these women up um, Quite a, quite a few years now, every year, to look at their health. Yeah. And unfortunately, we've found that mental health is getting worse, not better. Yeah. More than half of young women born in the early 90s reported a high levels of psychological distress when they were aged 18 to 23, back in 2013. The data was so shocking when we saw this that we actually thought there was some kind of a mistake, some, some kind of a mistake with our coding, someone had done something wrong. But unfortunately, this pattern of psychological distress in these young women has remained stable over time. And it's also been conf confirmed by some other data that we now can link to. So we've been able to look at women's medication records. So the survey data is now linked to the pharmaceutical benefits schedule. And we're able to see the medications that um, these young women are accessing for their mental health. And we've found high use of mental health related medications among young women under the age of 25. So about almost 30% of them um, were 30% of the prescriptions these women were using were for their mental health. And if you can take a look yep, at the, the top line there, that red line, you'll see that if we look at the prescriptions by women's levels of psychological distress, women who had very high levels of psychological distress, 40% of them were having some kind of, of mental health um, medication. It seems like a bit of a gloomy story, doesn't it? It really did seem like the new generations of young women were indeed getting worse. If only we could actually compare them. And luckily, because of our data, we could. So we were able to compare the new young cohort of women born in the early 90s with the original young cohort of women who were born in the 70s when they were both aged between 18 and 23 years. And we, we had a look at the two, court, to, two cohorts of these women on a measure of perceived stress. And this is a really nice measure um, because it shows, it asks women to how they're feeling in different aspects of their lives, ranging from work to study um, to relationships. And we compared the two generations of young women and we did find marked differences in the stress levels of young women born in the early 90s compared to those born in the 70s when they were both in their early 20s. So more than half of the women born in the 90s had moderate to extreme levels of stress between the ages of 18 to 23 compared to around a third of women in the 70s at the same age. And three times as many women born in the, in the early 90s were very or extremely stressed compared to women born in the 70s at the same age. 
we also looked at generational differences in self-rated health. So we find self-rated health tends to be a good indicator of future comorbidities and is actually a really nice, really good indicator of overall longevity, which is interesting because it is just based on women's um, self-report. And similar to the results for stress, there were differences in self-rated health for the two generations of young women at between the ages of 18 to 23. So there's a lot going on here, but this figure presents the odds of being in poor or being in poor or fair health among women in the 90s relative to women born in the 70s. So compared to the cohort of women born in the 70s, women born in the early 90s were 1.7 times more likely to say that their health was fair or poor. But the differences in self-rated health between the two generations were largely explained by differences in stress. So as you can see here, the odds have really dropped down when we took into account the differences in stress between the two generations of women. So we only found small differences in self-rated health between the two generations when we took into account the stress levels. So this means that for young women, stress is an important determinant of their overall health. This reminds us that mental and physical health interact to affect each other in reciprocal ways. This is why it's important to have broad definitions of health that acknowledge the complex web of factors that influence our health. If you remember, our measure of stress looked at stress across different aspects of women's lives, including relationships and money. And this reminds us that social and economic factors are important um, drivers of women's health. So in terms of supporting young women, we need to look beyond the individual and take a multi-layered approach that considers the communities in which we live and also the adequacy of the social structures to support our health. So I leave by asking you, based on this data, are we offering adequate support to young women? What can we do better? Thank you. I'm going to change, um, shift a little bit and also take up Rosemary's challenge. Clearly she has scared me a lot. Um, and that's not to talk about any single piece of research, but to come back to the question that she posed at the beginning about what is it that we can actually do to implement some of the priorities that are um, outlined in the um, National Women's Health Strategy? And what are some of the things that people are doing at the moment? And are there things that we can take take? Are there things that we can extend? Are there some ideas that we can borrow from each other? Now, I'm going to, because um, because we can only ever talk, you know, with confidence about our own stuff, I'm going to talk about what's happening at Western Sydney University. And so I'm going to talk about some of the research that is coming out of our institution, but in particular, the, the approach we've taken when it comes to looking at a very holistic way at um, women's health, and in this instance, looking at women's um, mental health. So, um, the challenge, as though there is only one challenge, okay? Jayeshri nicely actually um, did something that struck me um, when I was trying to put this together for mental health as we approach it at Western Sydney um, University. It's impossible to understand women's mental health without understanding reproductive health. And it's a shame that we've actually got downstairs another session which is on, uh, on sexual and reproductive health because I'd also like to be down there. I want to be in both of those sessions. And so what I've um, put up here is essentially... The approach that we've taken at Western Sydney is to look at mental health as a life course issue. And when you look at it as a, as a life course issue for women, you cannot I ignore reproductive health. And so you can see here that I've identified many of the same areas that Jayeshree has already identified and their links. And I've got along the side here that this is all exacerbated by mental health. We cannot separate these things. And I think the, the statistic that Jay Ashri brought out that was very clear, the single, no, if we can stay back, the single challenge that we have is that women are at the greatest risk of mental ill health. That's, that's clear. And even though within women we can see differences and older women are, are you know, fare better than younger women, if 
we put the flip on that and compare that against men, women are at higher risk of, of, of mental ill health. And the reproductive life cycle, uh, re reproductive life cycle is, is critical to that. Sexual health, we also know, impacts upon mental health. Sexual violence, we also know, impacts upon mental health. And of course, our physical health, socioeconomic status, sociocultural identity issues, all of these impact upon our mental health. So it's impossible to understand this unless we understand what it is to actually be a woman. Okay? Next one, please. I'm from Western Sydney University. I'll just say Western because our university invested in a very large and expensive rebrand, and so I'm to say just Western. But Western Sydney University is positioned smack bang in the middle of Western Sydney and Greater Western Sydney. And for those who don't know some of the demographics or the profile of Western Sydney, I think Western is well suited to actually tackling some of these problems because of what actually occurs or what um, we see as our profile in Western Sydney. Marginalised women are those women who are most at risk for poorer mental health outcomes. In Western Sydney, many of these dif different points of marginalisation actually come together and are at some of their highest levels. It is estimated by 2028 that Western Sydney will have a population of 3 million. Okay? So these numbers are, are, are phenomenal if we have a look at, at the, the, the experiences of some of the groups that we have. We have a large number of ref refugee, refugee and migrant women, so a very large cow population. We have a very large gender and sexually diverse population. We have a very large Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population, in fact, the largest in Australia. And we have many women of low socioeconomic status. And what we also know is, as I said, that these actually converge in Western Sydney and that these are all predictors of poor mental health. We also understand that these marginalised women have particular challenges when it comes to taking up services that may be available. And there are many good services, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these marginalised groups will go to or take up these services. We know that these marginalised women are less likely to engage in health services due to a whole range of individual and systemic challenges. Marginalised women are less likely to access and utilise mental health services. Women from certain cowed populations are less likely to disclose things such as domestic violence and a whole range of other sexual and reproductive issues. Um, they're less like, uh, we also know that marginalised populations are less likely to have adequate information to help them make, um, make decisions. So the, the importance that Leanne spoke of earlier about health literacy is critical within marginalised populations. And they're also less likely to know about and to participate in those preventative health strategies. Yes, thanks. So at Western, we decided to have a look at changing our thinking. And we started from a base of biology, OK? We started from a base of the physical and knowing that there is so much in there. So next slide, please. So when I put up the social determinants of health, it's not to underscore the biology. It's actually to it's it's from a position of assuming the biology has pro, um, has um, prominence in this area. But the approach that we have taken at Western, and I'll show you that this is a <coughs> university wide approach, is to also layer on top of that the social determinants of health. And um, Jane has spoken about that and others, so I don't need to labour that. So I'll I'll move on for Rosemary's sake. Next slide, please. But the other thing that we've done at Western is also to layer into this intersectionality, to also see this is not just about the social determinants of health, not just about identifying individual risk factors or protective factors, but also have a look at how this actually intersects with other key identities and positions that women may hold. So we see this as a fundamental social, um, social issue, as a fundamental justice issue. So we look at the intersections with identity. We look at the intersection with culture, biology, um, heritage, um, economic position, status. So one of the things that we've done at Western, and we're not unique in doing this. I'm, I'm looking around the room at, at women's, um, women researchers here whose work I admire, who I know do all of this. But I think what one of the key things we've done at Western Sydney is that we've brought all of this together in a couple of initiatives so that this is being rolled out as a program rather than just single pieces of research. Yes, please? So what has Western actually identified and what is underpinning the work that we're doing? The research that we've done has had significant impact, and I can talk about that uh, on individual projects. Um, 
But why it's had significant impact is because I think we've done a couple of things right. We use multiple methods, okay? Um, routinely, we bring the qual and the quant and other innovative art-based methods and a whole range of techniques, as well as very clinical and, and physiological t um, methods as well. We look at intersecting research themes and intersecting areas, and we do this all in partnership with our stakeholders. Co-design, Leanne spoke about this, Jane spoke about this, is critical to what we actually do. Next slide, please. So I'm the director of the Translational Health Research Institute. Looks like this. Okay, not me. Um, and under the umbrella of the Translational Health Research Institute, we've been able to do several things across the university. Yeah, next slide. <coughs> we've put together a series of white papers Okay, where we've identified what we see as a, as a priority issue, where we have capacity as a university, not as a team of researchers, but as a university to actually bring about change. And two of those white papers that are significant in the mental health theme are ones that we've done around maternal anxiety and one that we've done most recently around sexual and reproductive health. We're also, um, it will be launched within the, um, about probably by um, the end of the month, we'll be launching one also around uh, women and mental health and music therapy as well. Next slide, please. We've also got a couple of research concentrations that sit within the umbrella of, um, of the Translational Health Research Institute. We take a life course approach, but we don't just start at adolescence or young adulthood. One of our research centres, TEACH, Transforming Early Education and Childhood Health, focuses on those critical 2,000 days. The first 1,000 days we know are critical for setting down the formation of a, a range of physical health conditions. The first 2,000 days are critical for setting down the foundations for psychological wellbeing and resilience. Next one, please. We also have a second research concentration that sits within three, which is called Young and Resilient, which is looking at adolescents and young adults and how they use technology, how they use their apps and their phones and everything else that it is to either engage with their own health status and build resilience, or how do these apps, how do these technologies actually make them vulnerable and isolated in a changing social world? So, so we very much are focusing on those early stages. Next slide, please. We also have another research group um, that sits within three, um, which is looking specifically at weight and uh, weight disorders. And not just anorexia, but looking at anorexia and obesity together, looking at these as weight concern conditions. Um, and the, and, and rather, as I said, rather than just focusing on one of the particular um, conditions or disorders. So the key issue for us in the Translational Health Research Institute, we run across all schools, we run across um, all divisions within the university. I'm in the School of Medicine, but we have people that work within social sciences and psychology. We have people working with nursing and midwifery. Um, we have people working in, um, in, in chemistry, in economics and in education. This is a whole of university approach. And because what we're doing is working for change. Next one, please. And it's not just working together internally within the university. The key issue for us is co-design. Everything we do operates within an integrated knowledge translation framework. And it's also not just working with our consumer groups and our key stakeholder groups. It's working with key initiatives such as this. So being part of and being, and I, I'd like to thank Jean Hales for the opportunity to be part of these sorts of discussions and working with other groups is, is critically important. Jane said that she's looking forward to working with everyone. I'm going to steal the same line. Thanks, Jane. So Nikki has the task of trying to summarise what we've talked about, but we will also, of course, have notes and mon many of your comments to take forward into a summary. Um, just before I go into the summary, I'll take advantage of the fact that I have got the microphone um, to just draw your attention to the work of Alain Mayer, who has come up with the concept of minority stress. Because I think initially his work was, of course, in relation to LGBTI communities, but of course it sits across so many um, disenfranchised um, groups, and of course there are many, but it is, you know, and I'm, I'm going to look at the article in the conversation because I think it's the reason that the mental health, the state of mental health is just not shifting. There's only so much many of us can take, and um, at many times when we feel 
that we have great resilience at time that resilience is greatly challenged and there are lots of many factors just as to why that's the case. Um, so look, in, in summing up, I had a process for how I was going to sum up because I thought we were going to be going into groups and um, so I was very engaged in the panel but I think we've been on a wonderful journey around mental health in this session this afternoon with the various perspectives that have been presented by the key speakers the whole notion of the social determinants, the biology, and also that integrated transnational research and the heart of co-design and how those, those research projects bring things together and how important that is. And I'm reminded also of just the complexity of when we look at one thing, it's like Pandora's box and we open it up and it's so multifaceted and so complex. And then I'm sort of... Um, energised, I think I would say, by these sorts of events, by the fact that we can come together with such great diversity in the room and say things that we agree, say things that we disagree, but use all of this opportunity to have those conversations so that we can explore some more and make those connections so that the strategy becomes alive. And I think it's a wonderful way to bring the strategy alive by bringing us together to work on it. Because even if we all just take one more little step as we are here, and as we move away from here, then that strategy becomes a reality <coughs> and, women, and women's lives change, and that's really important. As I will have the microphone, I will say, please visit our website. We have a template letter that can be sent to Minister Suka to get our uh, sexuality, <coughs> gender and intersex status questions into the census. Right. We have a very small window of opportunity. We're talking weeks, so if you could do that, we'd be most grateful. And thank you all very much indeed for participating.